Thanks, Anthony. And now as Anthony plays our opening hymn, I will uh, go over and light the uh, candles in our sanctuary. And if you're wondering about the voices in this uh, hymn, it was our very first virtual recording over at Hatfield when we just started uh, doing this. About 10 years ago, it seems. It feels like mm. so long ago, yeah. <laughs> There. Thank you very much. And now we'll turn to our call to worship. And as you know, we'll uh, ask you all to remain muted, uh, but to please follow along at home with the uh, responses. But Anthony will be the only audible one for the people's response. Our call to worship. Come, people of God, to the one in whom we trust. Praise God who delivers and rescues us in times of need. God is our rock of refuge, our strong fortress in times of trial. God saves us amid the cruelties of this world. Hope in God, who has created all things well. Let us open ourselves to the one who knows our innermost selves. God accepts us as we are, even when others will not. 
He affirms us when others would try to stifle our individuality. We have been given tasks to do, but God also gives us the strength to accomplish them. God's love is powerful in us. We have gathered to embrace the mystery of God's love and to be embraced by the perfect love of Christ. Now coming together as this congregation, even though physically separated all around these various areas here, just Kathy and I in the building, we still come together in Christ and in the spirit. Our unison prayer. God of a perfect, all-embracing love, in whose name we have been consecrated for discipleship, encounter us in this sacred hour of worship so that we may grow closer to you and also to one another. Upset our priorities so we may make more room for faith, hope, and love. Disturb our certainties when they fail to accept the challenge of Christian love. Expand our horizons to encompass ideas we may not have been willing to entertain before. Open our hearts to people who may have been, we may have been hesitant to welcome. Perfect among us that trust born of a deep faith that allows us to be transformed into a people willing to give ourselves completely to Christ and his service. Amen. And Anthony, if you'd now lead us in the Gloria Patri. Jeff. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay. I'm reading 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all, away all my possessions, and if I, had, if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. <clears throat> Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For, for we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. <clears throat> And I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to the childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we, we see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. Amen. Thanks, Jeff, very much appreciate it. So now let us uh, kind of turn to the children's uh, sermon, but it's really not a message just for children by any means. Um, so Anthony, if you could screen share. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these. There, there's a lot of them out there on the internet. Um, but our usual focus is on the, the, the symbols there. Uh, that's what draws us in at our first glance. And so if we're looking at the red symbols, 
it doesn't much mean anything. It just it's gobbledygook. There, there's nothing there. Maybe it's even a foreign language of some sort or some kind of computer code or hieroglyphics. It doesn't say anything to us. But then if we can get past the normal, what we you know, usually automatically do, focusing on the symbols, if we can start thinking about looking at the spaces in between those symbols, among those symbols, all of a sudden in the white, the white spaces, Jesus's name pops out. And once you see Jesus's name, it's really hard to not see it anymore. And you wonder, how did I not see it in the first place? But our eyes, our brain, it's, it's just, it's wired to go to the symbols, not the spaces. And so the first thing we concentrate is on the symbols. And we have to do the extra effort of looking more deeply, concentrating more deeply to see the spaces to see Jesus. And, you know, once you see Jesus, your brain, it starts toggling back and forth. So I don't know if you're like me, but it, it keeps going back from Jesus to red symbols, Jesus to red symbols, because your brain doesn't really know what to do with this kind of picture, because ordinary brain perception is focusing on the red, not the white. I give you that message because we're going to have the second part of this uh, gospel story in Luke's gospel of Jesus going back to his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. And when he goes back to his hometown synagogue in Nazareth, the people there, they do what we just did. They, they focus on the ordinary way of seeing. And they see only like symbolically the red here. And it doesn't make any sense when Jesus says, the spirit of God is upon me. God has sent me. All those me things, it just doesn't make sense to them because they're focusing on the obvious. They're focusing on the red symbols. You know, for a moment, they have this glimpse because it says that, you know, they, they, they're awed by Jesus and then they get mad. But for a second, they're awed by Jesus. And so for a second, they can see through all of the gobbledygook and they see Jesus, like here it is in the white spaces. They see that Jesus in the extraordinary way that he is not just a mere mortal. And so when they see that, they feel it but they immediately tamp it down and they go back to the ordinary red spaces. They, they, they will not allow themselves to believe in Jesus as more than ordinary. And so just like we have to train our brain to not look at the red symbols, but to look in between the red symbols and then all of a sudden Jesus pops out, we have to be very careful that we don't let the ordinary mask the extraordinary because Jesus is still in our world. Jesus is still active. Jesus is still in the church. And the church is not this building that's filled with two people. The church is all of us coming together in Jesus, called together by Jesus. So Jesus is here. Hopefully you can feel him here. Hopefully he touches you here in your thoughts. But most of all, we're going to hear today, as, as Jeff said, we're going to concentrate throughout the service. Most of all, it's going to be in love. When you have that special kind of Christian love, Jesus is present. That's the scene that we're talking about when you, you focus beyond the ordinary and concentrate on the extraordinary. In love is how you see Jesus, how you see the extraordinary. So my prayer for you, because if there are young people that will be joining later via tape or if they're here and I just can't see you on screen, the miracle of faith is to let us see and believe in the extraordinary all around us. And I hope whatever age we are, we can always be amazed by that power that God is in the extraordinary, in the ordinary. So in Jesus's name, let us pray that we can see the extraordinary. Amen. And now let us turn to uh, back to Anthony for our choir anthem, Take My Life and Let It Be. And thanks to John and Judy for helping record this one. Take my life and let it be consecrated Lord to
Thank you, John and Judy. Thank you very much. Very nice. So let us now turn to our prayers. Um, let me begin by offering a prayer for husband Wilson and sons Bruce and Brian. And this is offered by wife and mother Thelma M. Uh, so Thelma is back at home and uh, she asked us to offer these prayers. Um, I'm not sure she can be with us. I don't think she's with us here online, uh, but Thelma is home from the nursing home and doing very well. I saw her earlier this week and uh, she's, uh, she's her same feisty self. So uh, Thelma is at home and asked us for these prayers to be shared. We also continue to pray for our nation as we face the reality of persistent and institutional racism. And we pray for the 363 million people infected by COVID-19 worldwide, 73 million of them right here, and the astounding figure of 875,000 people who have died and continue to die in our country from this pandemic. So let's do the best that we can to be safe out there. And obviously that's why we are uh, joining only via a live stream for our worship today. And also next Sunday, again, just only on, um, on, on the computers. And then after that, on February 13th, we will be coming back to hybrid. Uh, but at least for now, we're trying to do our part to stay safe and healthy to help the frontline workers. And so I thank you for joining us uh, via the live stream. So before we go um, on to the printed prayers, are there any people out there in the World Wide Web that want to uh, share special prayers at this time? Joys, celebrations, concerns? Lisa. Um, I'd like to put my um, my aunt Marty, Marty Brown on the prayer list. She's my mother's sister who lives in Virginia and she has late stages of cancer and is in a lot of pain and um, is staying home on pain medicine, but just prayers for her, uh, her comfort and peace as she goes through this process. Absolutely. Thank you, Lisa. Anybody else have any prayers you want to say or celebrations, anything like that? Okay, then let us turn to our printed prayer list that was uh, sent out to us with the bulletin. And I don't know, if, there we go. So let us pray for Alice, Art, Betsy, Bill, Bonnie, Candy, Carrie, Charlene, Cindy, Denise, Evelyn, Jeff, Jimmy, John, Josh, Karis, Lisa, Matthew, Melissa, Michael, Michelle, Prue and Bart, Richard and Sue, Steve, Thelma, Vinny, Wes, and Wink, victims of violence everywhere in the world, those affected by natural disasters around the globe, and we pray for peace on earth. So at this point, with our uh, prayer shared uh, vocally, let us also say those prayers to Jesus that we really can't say out loud, uh, that they are just too personal, uh, too dear, too, too uh too private to uh, share out loud. So let us just, um, in the middle of our public worship, have a few moments of silence to say those things to Jesus that are just between uh, Jesus and us. A few moments of silence. Reassuring God, whose word became flesh in Jesus of Nazareth, and whose healing power worked miraculously through him, look upon us with understanding and the patience that we need. Give us the time and the opportunities to see in our faith and worship the glorious mystery that Jesus remains in our midst and that Jesus still works wonders. Equip us to listen, to speak, and to embody 
the Christian love that is the epitome of our faith. May we bear all things, believe, hope, and endure, so that through us the world will have its chance to hear the gospel and to feel the nearness of Jesus. Help us likewise to know that our prayers are heard and that they are cherished by you. Answer them, we pray, as you alone know, uh, alone know best. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So let us now come together in the prayer that Jesus gave to all of us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Anthony. <clears throat> Jesus was God's new revelation, but people had grown accustomed to him and to hearing the old, and it was not easy for them to believe and to change when he preached. They could not hear the word of God. They only heard their own consciences. With a prophetic voice and a courageous life, Jesus embodied God's perfect love, and this was a new message. We are called upon to continue that ministry as Christians and as church to be brave in our proclamation of Christian love. We are meant to influence the world that too often concentrates on power and greed and not on love. Such a ministry requires the best that we have to offer because we are fighting up against the stream. Our faith asks us to share ourselves and our talents and our time and even our treasure. What we give to Christ through this church, it symbolizes our own spiritual commitments. Therefore, may our contributions be as generous as our faith expects and as our conditions in life allow. And since it's only the two of us here in the building, the, uh, the, the plates are not full, but we can share our gifts uh, to the church by mailing them directly here uh, to this building. And so we do hope that you'll continue to be generous even from your homes. Um, at this time, Anthony, if you'd lead us in the singing of the doxology. Accept, O Lord, these offerings now to be placed symbolically here in your sanctuary as a representation of our love for you and for others. May you use these gifts for your purposes, we pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen. So I was asking uh, Kathy, um, you know, we did get a brand new furnace for the downstairs, a rather small one, but still a $7,000 uh, cost. Um, so even though you're sitting comfortably at home, I see people drinking nice, you know, warm coffee and everything else. Um, we still have to pay all of the bills here. And so $7,000 bill dropped out of nowhere. And so if anybody is able, um, additional donations are greatly appreciated as well as your regular donations. And thank you for everything that you do so that we can keep uh, serving Christ and community through this congregational church here in Sunderland. So thank you for your generosity. Now our reflecting hymn, and I do hope that as you're remaining muted at home, I hope you'll sing along. Uh, this is a beautiful hymn. Uh, this is our, the, our uh, what is it? I lost my place. Uh, Be Not Afraid, our reflecting hymn. You can cross the barren desert, but you will not die first. You can wander far in safety, though you do not know the way. You can speak your words to foreign lands, and all will understand. You shall see the face of God in me. Be not afraid. 
If you pass through the raging waters in the sea, you will not drown. If you walk amid the burning flames, you will not be bound. If you stand before the power of hell, and death is at your side, know that I am with you through it all. Be not afraid. I go before you. Blessed are the poor, for the kingdom shall be theirs. Blessed are you with weep and mourn, for one day you shall have. And blessed are the pure in heart, for their eyes shall not be true. Blessed, oh blessed are you. And today's gospel is taken from Luke chapter 4, verses 21 through 30. And then Jesus began to say to them at the Nazareth synagogue, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of Jesus, and they were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. But then they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did in Capernaum. And Jesus said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to the widow of Zarephath. And this was in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them was cleansed except for Naaman the Syrian. And when they heard this, all in that synagogue were filled with rage at Jesus. And they got up and they drove him out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they may hurl Jesus off the cliff. But Jesus passed through their midst and went on his way. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. This past Monday night, we received a, a nice covering of snow, almost as much as the, the blizzard that we got yesterday. And after that snow, it happened on Monday and Tuesday, I took my dog for our usual walk. And from my previous you know, excursions, I know that there's an awful lot of ice out there along the same route that we take all the time. And before Monday's snow, I could pretty much see where all of that ice was. But after the snow, it was harder to tell where that ice was lurking beneath the snow. And this meant that I had to keep my head bowed down. I had to keep my eyes trained on my very next step and where it was going to be going down. And I'm all, you know, I'm, I'm up on the upper fairways of the Cherry Hill Golf Course in Amherst. And there are places up there where it's awfully slippery and it would be real easy to fall down and maybe break my leg. You know, I've seen enough horse movies to know that when you break your leg, I know what they do to you. So I'm being really careful. So I'm walking really deliberately, eyes down, only like one step in front of me. So I know where my next step is gonna be. And then all of a sudden up there on that fairway, the, the sun breaks through. And all of a sudden, because it had broken through, it just grabbed my attention for a second. And I stopped 
And I look around again in the middle of this golf fairway in the middle of winter. And I'm surprised at how beautiful everything is. The snow is fresh and clean and white. You know, there's not all that brown stuff on it yet. The, the trees, you've seen the trees when they got the snow just hanging off the branches. The sun is beaming off of the snow. And there's all those little, you know, crystal reflections that just look so pretty and sparkle. You know, my dog, my dog's none too happy that we stopped. But I paused a bit so that I didn't have to look down to where I was going to next step. And instead, I just stood there in the middle of this golf fairway and, and took it all in. It was gorgeous. You know, sometimes we can get so caught up in the ordinary that we can miss the simultaneous extraordinary. It's, it's like walking with your, your head down, looking only where you're going to plant your next step. You know, it's very practical. It's a good way to stay safe. And we have to live in our practical real world. But, you know, when you don't ever take the time to pause and lift your eyes to see all that is beautiful around you, it kind of takes something out of the ordinary. You know, it, it, it takes away the purpose of the ordinary. We're, we're here in this world to live and to survive, but to do hopefully more than just survive. And, you know, the ordinary cannot be ignored, obviously. I don't want to go to the hospital with a broken leg. You don't want to fall on the ice and do anything worse than even a broken leg. But in that same ordinary can also lurk the extraordinary, you know, if we but take the time and make a conscious effort to look for it. This past week was the first of our monthly brown bag lunches for Hamden, Franklin, and Hampshire Association clergy. And right now they're online, like we're doing online now, but we're also hoping that we can spend time together before too long. And since it was our first meeting, just like this, we went around our screen and introduced ourselves to each other. And I especially enjoyed one pastor's story. His first name is Bert, and he entered the ministry after making a living as a truck driver. And this is the same guy who has memorized Mark's gospel in its entirety, word for word, 16 chapters, word for word. He's memorized the gospel. And I heard him once because he was invited over to the Waitley Congregational Church a number of years ago, and I heard him there. And I wonder if he started memorizing the gospel, maybe while he was driving his truck. Maybe he had one of those, you know, audio books, and maybe he just played it over and over and over again in the cab of his truck. And maybe he took something ordinary, like long haul driving, and turned it into something extraordinary and became able to share the good news in a special and unique and captivating way that a lot of others could never do. I can't memorize nothing. Forget it. If I learn one phrase and then I go on to learn the next phrase, the first phrase disappears. But this guy has memorized 16 chapters of Mark's gospel word for word. And he presents it like a story, and it's so captivating. So he took something ordinary, driving his truck, and turned it into something extraordinary, sharing the gospel. Now, these examples of the ordinary harboring the extraordinary bring me around to the second part of the gospel story about Jesus visiting his old hometown synagogue in Nazareth, like we talked about last week. So last Sunday, that first part of the story, Jesus got up from his bench along the edge of the building, and the Spirit of the Lord, he says, is upon me. Uh, you know, God has anointed me. God has sent me. And that word me kept coming back for reinforcement. You know, it's upon me. And when his old neighbors heard this, they were astounded, and they were confused, and they became angry. Their first reaction, though, says Luke, is amazement. Jesus's words were gracious. That is, says the Bible's word, filled with grace. That is the power and the presence of God. And Jesus's neighbors felt that. They felt the power of Jesus's words when he said, the spirit of God is upon me. God has sent me. God has anointed me. They felt something special. And they, they couldn't deny it because it's right there. There was something in his words that, that, that conveyed the presence of God. But then their thoughts caught up with these first spontaneous reactions of theirs. And they became irritated with Jesus. I think they may have been saying something like, you know, wait a minute. You know, I, I felt something here. But isn't that Joseph's son? You know, don't we know his family? Doesn't he live in that house down there? Didn't he repair our window, you know, before he took off for John the Baptist? That's Joseph's son. And he, he can't be special, they thought. He's the carpenter. He's ordinary. 
So like I was trying to say in the, in the children's message, it really isn't a children's message. They would only concentrate on the obvious, those, those red symbols that didn't mean anything. And they wouldn't look past the symbols and let them go to the extraordinary and see the name of Jesus that really just pops off the page as soon as you see it the first time. So there was this flash realization of the extraordinary in Jesus. But his old neighbors in Nazareth, they tamped it down because they insisted, they forced themselves to see only the ordinary in him. They were so greatly offended by what they perceived as Jesus's pride and arrogance because they only saw him or were only willing to see him as ordinary that they actually tried to do him harm. And this was such an experience for Jesus that he never ever comes back to his hometown of Nazareth again. He never goes home again after that. Jesus's old neighbors, figuratively, they only walked with their, their heads down, being very safe, being very cautious, being very practical, not allowing that, that first feeling of, oh my gosh, there's something going on here in Jesus. They, they, they tamped that down and they peaked up for only a second and, and they admitted to feeling the power of Jesus's words, but then they just as quickly, they put their heads back down because they didn't want to admit in the extraordinary and believe in Jesus, that this boy that grew up in town, that this man who was the carpenter in town, that God was working through him, they wouldn't allow themselves to believe that. Now, it's easy to fault those people from long ago and far away, but that's not the purpose of God's still speaking word. Our faith, it calls on us to learn from that mistake. Our faith is about seeing it and seeing if there's signs that maybe that's happening still in our world, maybe even in our lives, and maybe we can be better this time. And just how are we supposed to, to do this? How are we supposed to see Jesus in the ordinary? How do we not dismiss the ordinary presence of God all around us? You know, I, um, I can only read like a layman's, you know, science. I can't do science, but I love reading about a layman's and, you know, when they, they can put it in layman's terms about science. And, and I'm always, on a day like this, when you look out these church windows, and I don't know where you are in your house, but if you can look out, it's a gorgeous day out there. And, you know, we're sending, you know, uh, these, these telescopes to look out into space. We have rovers on Mars. And if they ever found the slightest hint of life anywhere in the world, front page, New York Times, is, is breaking news. Everybody would be talking if they found the slightest hint of life. We have gorgeous life all around us. It's ordinary, but isn't it extraordinary? Isn't life itself a gift of God? Isn't, isn't there, there are miracles that are all around us so often and we just simply don't pay attention because they're always there? So one of the ways that we need to, to see God is to not take the ordinary for granted. You know, Jeff also read 1 Corinthians 13 for us today, and it closes with that often quoted verse. There are faith, hope, and love. There are these three, but the greatest of these. Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Paul tells us that if we do not have love, we have nothing. And the way he actually says is, now we have nothing. I am nothing. He says, if I don't have love, I am nothing. All I'm doing is boasting. All I am is a, is a clanging cymbal or a gong. I'm just making sounds, but I am nothing if I don't have love. So this kind of love, it comes from Jesus. It's a sure sign that Jesus is near. You know, it, it can't it can actually stand in for Jesus. When you see that kind of love, when you feel that kind of love, Jesus is somewhere around. And it's, it's so unnatural. You know, our instincts tell us to love the ones who love us and everybody else. You got to be cautious. You got to be, you know, you have to be careful the way you treat them. And if somebody is mean to you, our reaction is to be mean back to them. You know, that's the way the world works, sadly. But this kind of love that Jesus is talking about you lead with it, and it perseveres, it stays, no matter how bad it gets. That's supernatural. That's not ordinary love. That's a supernatural love. This kind of love, you know, this comes from God, and it doesn't have to be reciprocal. You know, it's not like Valentine's love. I give you this, this card because I know you love me, and you, you know, back and forth. No, it's not candies and flowers and cards. This is the kind of love that's hard. It's really hard when somebody doesn't like you to like them that one passage about turn the other cheek, that doesn't make sense. If somebody slaps me on one face or side, I'm supposed to turn the other. It doesn't make sense. But that's what Jesus's love is talking about. This is supernatural. It's not natural. And it's the only kind of love that makes sense out of following Jesus and making sense out of his life and his ministry 
and his death. This is the only way it makes sense. So to learn from the example of the Nazareth synagogue people, we need to be watchful and not let what appears to be ordinary blind us to the extraordinary, because that's where Jesus is in the world. You know, it may seem ordinary to donate food to people we may never know, or to donate, you know, a heifer to people halfway around the world. That's not logical. We're taking something that we have, and we don't have a lot of it, and we're giving it to people we don't know. You know, that, that's not ordinary. That's a supernatural love. It's an impractical kind of love. But maybe that's the way that Jesus walks into our world if we look. You know, it may seem ordinary to be a congregation that welcomes anyone and everyone to, to stand up for the dignity of people, no matter the color of their skin, the way that they choose to love, whatever. You know, whoever they are, they are welcome here. That's what we say basically at the beginning of every one of our services. And it's not just an ordinary statement. We mean it. Whoever you are, you are welcome here. You know, and this kind of a, a love, that's special in our world today, where that's not always, you know, expressed. Maybe that is Jesus walking into our lives. Maybe it's ordinary, but it's extraordinary. You know, it may seem ordinary to sing the same hymns that we have sung countless times to say prayers that we've actually memorized to gather weekend after ordinary weekend. But this may be the only time in a world filled with news of war and just ridiculous amounts of brutality in a thousand different horrible forms this may be the only place where we hear that love is patient and kind. Love is not envious or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. It rejoices in the truth and love never ends. These ordinary Sundays of the special times when Jesus may be walking into our church and church is not the building with only Kathy and me here. Church is us coming together, called by Christ, in Christ. So look for those signs of love that you know, we may sometimes overlook because Jesus is in the ordinary and he can make them extraordinary because Christian love, that's not from here. That, that's from God. And every time you see that extraordinary Christian love, know that Jesus is somewhere nearby. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And let us now turn back to Anthony for our hymn of closing. Come thou almighty king.
Thank you, Anthony. Uh, let me make one more plug for Bible study tomorrow, seven to eight. If you'd like to attend, uh, just send me an email if you're not one of the regular ones because you're already on the list. Uh, but if you'd like to attend, I can send you the login for that for tomorrow from seven to eight. So let us now uh, have our benediction and then our congregational response closing. Let us go forth with an increased willingness to believe in Jesus and his gospel. May this renewed faith fill us with hope so that we may find the strength to help change the world. Let the scriptures be fulfilled by our willingness to imitate the perfect love that was lived and taught by Jesus of Nazareth. When the choice needs to be made between what Jesus has revealed and what we may want to hear, may our time spent here now in worship help us to follow Christ and his better example of love. So may we now go forth to love and serve the Lord in all that we do among all whom we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.